All right, that worked. Okay, good Friday morning, uh, Backyard Naturalist friends. It's the last day of May for a Backyard Naturalist this year. It's not the last day of May, it's the last week of May, um, which means winter is almost over here in Wisconsin. So per usual, we can skip right over spring and go to summer. Uh, my name is Tim. I will be your host for this week's episode uh, of the Backyard Naturalist, which is brought to you by the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee. This is the first of three episodes, and I'm going to need your help here. This is the first three episodes where the focus will be on an organism that is named for a calendar month. And at, at first glance, I could only think, I didn't do a ton of thinking, but I can only think of three the mayfly, the June bug, and the June barrier. And I'm sure there's others, and please let me know. Um, uh, there are, I also noticed there are several species that are named after seasons, a lot of species that are named after seasons. The, the winter berry, the summer tanager, the spring peeper, autumn meadow hawk. Oh, that's, that was like not only four different organisms, those were four different groups, uh, plants, birds, amphibians. And I forgot what the fourth one was. Anyway, oh, dragonflies. So, um, th so these are the only three that I could think of that are named after months. I'm sure there are more, um, but for now, please sit back and relax and have a nice soothing, hot, good drink in hand. I hope um, that you can embrace and sip as we go on a journey of learning together. And this week's topic is the mayfly in episode 38 of season four of the Backyard Naturalist, What Dreams May Fly. And those flying dreams are supported by those of you who tune into the show, whether live or Friday mornings at nine or later uh, on YouTube channel, on the YouTube channel, wherever you are, whenever it is, I'm glad you're here. Um, if you'd like to join our subscriber community, your support allows you to no longer ever have to worry about registering, registering for this weekly gathering. You get the link sent right to you through space, through the magic of digital broadcasting of ones and zeros that are all around us right now. Your device can turn that jumble of digital noise into my voice and the pictures I'm sharing with you. That still blows my mind that this exists in our world. But here I am, here you are. And if you join our subscriber community, you also get free priority access to our monthly field trips around the backyards of Milwaukee, sorry, Massachusetts. Thank you to our subscribers. Thank you to anyone considering subscribing, but mostly, most importantly, thank you for being here today. I often like to use this platform to help us all keep tabs on the exploration of outer space and astronomical events. The very outer space that you can see from your backyard or your patio or your local park so much has happened over the past couple months that I got overwhelmed. There's too much, in fact, uh, for me to really get into without risking false advertising of what this episode is about. So I'm just going to boil it down to two things that have been on my mind. Uh, first of all, I think it's fair to say that Elon Musk is a complicated human being and his companies have undoubtedly impacted the world in major ways. Tesla is putting more and more electric cars on the roads. Uh, that's a good thing in the global climate change scenario. Uh, and his company SpaceX is pioneering much of our exploration of space, which I also think is a good thing. But one thing really kind of struck me recently after the, their Starship vehicle was blown up due to a separation failure. And I forget what they used to kind of uh, gloss over the fact that it was just an explosion. Um, but if it just like all of the chemicals, I mean, just tons and tons and tons of, of gallons, gallons and gallons, thousands of gallons of, of chemicals, materials, vaporizing, exploding in the air, debris shot over hundreds of acres. A lot of it is sensitive wildlife habitat. Um, it started a fire on the state parkland. So you know, um, what they call kind of a glitch or a, a learning step towards exploration uh, is a major, major pollution event. And so, you know, and I and I love exploration of space, but, and there's, there's a lot of groups that are filing lawsuits now against the FAA for this reason, um, their, their failure to assess the environmental impact of 
not only like the launches, but the explosions. Um, Cause even when rockets don't explode, you just have a massive input of, of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, fuel. Um, that might not be a huge deal when compared to, you know, commercial airline traffic or automobiles, but the plan for SpaceX is to have multiple daily trips to space at some point, and that would have a huge impact uh, on our atmosphere. And so, again, I love the idea of exploration. It's fascinating. It's exhilarating. But I'm just, like many others, worried of the global impacts. Um, and and the fact that a lot of this is being led by for-profit companies and which lays the foundation for the environmental impact to take a, a backseat to profit. So kind of a wet blanket that I'm putting over my own excitement, but at the same time, you know, knowing that there are people who are looking for, for cleaner fuels and cleaner ways to explore space. So I'll leave it at that. I'll 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 go back to to following these events, but I, I do feel it's right to put a lot of pressure on this industry uh, to do this in a much more responsible way. And then the other thing to talk about quickly is just more of a fun astronomical event that we can all look forward to uh, happening one week from today, next Friday, uh, June 2nd. If, you, if you're still awake, two hours past local sunset, so here in Milwaukee, that's uh, about 10.30 at night, the planet Mars is going to pass in front of the Beehive Star Cluster. Um, so if you have a, a good pair of binoculars, spotting scope, telescope, uh, it should be fairly easy to find Venus. Uh, hard, hard to miss where Venus is. And then from Venus, you can go up and to the left to look for the red planets. Um, and uh, National Geographic described it that Mars will be photobombing the Beehive Cluster, which is a, a concentrated group of stars, uh, about a thousand young stars, 600 light years from Earth. Um, and that meeting of Mars and the cluster will produce a, a really nice show for your binoculars. And then while you're at it, you know, to put the binoculars down and try to see if you can connect the dots that make up the constellation Cancer, the crab. Mars is going to be right in the middle of the cephalothorax of the crab, and so will the Beehive Cluster. So Here's hoping to clear skies and a good show one week from today in the evening. And speaking of a good show, I got to say that Mayflies put on a pretty good show of their own. And this just happens so often. I, I introduce a critter or a group. I think, okay, this will be a fun group to talk about. It might be short. There might not be a lot to talk about. Um, and I, you know, I... I thought that might happen with the Mayfly, but per usual, I was very wrong. In fact, I had to cut out a lot to get this to that kind of half hour time frame. Uh, it was really fun. And um, another thing I've noticed with this community is that science is has been, you know, pretty has been shying away from that traditional Linnaean classification system that. Jenny and I learned from the late Dr. Gustafson at Rufus King High School in the late 80s, uh, you know, kingdom file in class. We had to memorize it for the tests. It's still in use and it still has re relevance, but um, it's also supplemented with um, with alternatives. I, you know, like that, that simple structure becomes a lot more muddied when you take in genetic evidence and you look at other ways of classifying. Um, and so... In the Mayfly journey, we're not going to start with that simple one. We're going to look at a grouping called a division. That's not one we, we learned about in high school. And the division is called Paleoptera. So paleo means old or ancient, and terra means wing. So the name of this division translates to ancient wing because we think the wing structure of this group of insects retains the original uh, the original structure, the original um, uh, biomechanics of the very earliest, the very first winged or flying insects. So this division, ancient wing, is separated from a division called the Neoptera, or new wing. And most of the flying insects that we know are in the Neoptera. And they've evolved the ability to fold their wings back over their abdomen like a beetle, like the sawfly. Um, so most of the insects we see today have that 
capability of folding their wings back over their abdomen. Um, and as the name suggests, this group evolved that ability to do this from the old blueprint, which the Paleoptera have. And so the Neoptera are younger phylogenetically. Um, in fact, most members of the Paleoptera are extinct, um, with the exception of two major groups that are still around today. The mayflies and the odonates, uh, the dragonflies and damselflies. So these, these two groups of insects represent a more ancient lineage. Um, anatomically, besides that wing structure, there's another major difference in their brains. Um, the Neoptera have evolved smell centers in their brains and the Paleoptera don't. And so for many years, scientists thought that meant that the Neoptera could smell and the Paleoptera couldn't. But some recent studies have shown that Paleoptera are, are just as good at, at smelling. They just use a different mechanism, um, do it in a different way. So for anyone that cares, there is one extinct group of Paleoptera that independently evolved that ability to fold their wings back like the Neoptera, uh, did it through a different mechanism. Um, it's, a, it's a name that I think would be great for a, a kid, a child, or, or maybe a, a pet hamster, Diaphanopterodia. Um, this group went extinct at the end of the Permian, along with the trilobites and all those little critters you see at the museum uh, Permian Reef. Okay, and Milwaukee Public Museum. Um, unlike the Neopterans, the Paleopterans are not represented by a nice single branch of the evolutionary tree. <clears throat> but, you know, phylogeneticists over the years kind of have to put things in boxes. So the Paleoptera is really like a catch-all group. It's not one branch like the Neoptera. It's kind of like, you know, well, if it's not a Neoptera, we'll, we'll keep it in this Paleoptera. And incidentally, this also happened to a more familiar organism for most of us, the fish. There is no one branch of the family tree that represents fish. Fish are a grouping of similar but unrelated organisms that share certain characteristics. And if you don't believe me, we'll watch a quick video together. This is a BBC video, so due to copyright laws, uh, we have to stop recording while we watch it. All right. Okay, so. Back to my notes here. All right, so uh, we just watched a video referring to the work of Stephen Jay Gould. And now I have to do a side note to a side note because I played in a jazz band at McAllister College with Stephen Jay Gould's son, Ethan, who was a really good guitar player. But uh, anyway, so the, the video and the video phylogeneticists like Stephen Jay Gould argue that Biologically speaking, there is no such thing as a fish. A lot of the things we call fish aren't even closely related to other fish, but we just call all the things that live in the water and share certain characteristics fish. Um, so biologically speaking, there is such a thing as a bird. They're in the class aves. Biologically speaking, there is such a thing as a reptile. They're in the class reptilia. There's a mammal, but there is no such thing as a fish. Again, biologically speaking, just like there's no such thing as a vegetable, botanically speaking. But then my mom would point out there are cultural classifications. And if you look through that social lens, then yes, there are things that are called fish and vegetables, but biologically those things don't exist. So you came here to learn about mayflies and you're leaving learning there's no such thing as a fish or a vegetable. In any case, uh, I brought that up as an illustration that there's really no biological basis for this division paleopter. It was just created, uh, it was just a nice box into which we put these un unrelated groups of insects that can't fold their wings. So we talk about them as a group anyway. But from here, we go to a less phylogenetically contested group, the order Ephemeroptera, which is the group that we call the mayflies uh, in the Eastern United States. Some people call them shad flies because they emerge at the same time that the shad fish run up the rivers. Um, and then up here in the Midwest and in Canada, they're sometimes known as fish flies. Uh, and then across the pond in the UK, they have maybe my favorite, at least English name for them, the upwinged flies. 
The ephemero means short-lived or for a day, since the lifespan of most adult mayflies really is just about a day or two. There are over 3,000 species of mayfly, about 600 here in the U.S., and as an ancestral group of insects, they probably have, still share many of the traits that were present in the very earliest flying insects, like the long tails that we don't often see um, in, in a lot of the other insects. And then, of course, those non-folding wings uh, held upright, uh, like a butterfly or a, or a sail on a, on a boat. And then one of the things that was really fun that kind of struck me as I was doing this research on the mayfly is that a lot of the literature out there on mayflies comes from people who fly fish. So fly fisher people totally geek out on entomology. And I know there's a culture of, of fly fishing that I don't understand. I know some people that are kind of in that culture. Um, and, and, you know, there's a great, a great podcast, uh, This American Life or something about a, a, a theft of, of, of lures, but there's a really big culture out there. And one of the things that the connections I didn't make is that the fly fisher people have to, well, not have to, but they totally geek out on entomology, uh, studying insects. And I'm just, I was blown away by how much of fly fishing isn't just learning the techniques, which I know that alone is hard to master, but it's learning about the insects. It's really understanding uh, the insect life that allows you to catch fish. It just seems like so much, so many levels um, to fly fishing that just seem really, really fun. And and then making sure that when you're fishing, um, that you're using lures that imitate species of insects that should be around at that location at that time of year. And it even goes way beyond that. The lures, they, they imitate the appropriate life stages of the appropriate species for a given time and location. And so because uh, many insects are attracted to light, I heard a hot tip for if, if you are fly fishering. Um, that before you go out, you stop at a gas station and you check out the lights to see which species of insects are currently flying and what stages they're in. And then, and then you have your lure box and you find the right lures. Um, and if you don't have them, you, you, you make them or, um, you know, there's even talk of like, if they're emerging from, uh, you know, during an instar stage, maybe put a little pantyhose on them to, to imitate the, the cast off. Uh, exoskeleton. So just a, a really fascinating rabbit hole that I fell into uh, while looking looking at this episode and just how much fly fishing is tied to insect behavior and phenology and in particular uh, mayflies. So super interesting. Um, back to the adult mayfly stage, which is the shortest of all of their stages. Uh, one of the things that stands out is they have pretty interesting eyes. Um, and you know, some, some call them googly eyes, some call them turban eyes. Uh, they're split into upper eyes and the upper eyes are for detecting movement. Um, and, and so much of the adult adaptations, because they only live as adults for a couple days and they only have one thing to do during that day or two is to mate. So, so much of their adult adaptations are, are, are focused on mating. And so they have these upper eyes that are really focused on movement. Um, for for females that are flying above them, and then the lower eyes are 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 focused more on on details. Um, they pretty much focus on the UV range of light, um, and then the the combination of characteristics help them see in low light because most of the mating swarms happen at dawn or dusk. So, uh, just that's another rabbit hole. Just just how these these in these anatomical structures are are adapted specifically to this lifestyle and in the adults. Um, of just living a day or two. And another interesting characteristic of adult mayflies is that, again, through evolution um, and because of this, this lifestyle, they've really specialized on their front legs uh, in the adult stage. And those front legs, again, it's, it's used in courtship. It's used for grasping females during mating flights. Um, the rear pairs have very little effect. They're, they're, they don't do much. Um, and so the rear pairs on many insects are reduced. Sometimes they're completely gone. So they either have like little T-Rex legs in the back um, or, or they might even disappear. So then, and people through, through history have noted that, um, including Aristotle, that 
uh, some adult mayflies might only have two legs or four legs instead of the, the requisite six legs of insects. Um, so they're focused on those front legs because as an adult, um, they're used in mating and the back legs aren't that important. So adult mayflies live a very short life. Uh, like I said, usually a day or two in one species in particular, the, the Delania americana, the, the female adult lifespan is measured in minutes. And the average adult female lifespan of the species is less than five minutes. Um, so again, because adults are so short-lived, they don't eat, they don't need to eat. Um, they can drink water and particularly uh, males tend to live a little bit longer, you know, maybe living to the ripe old age of a, you know, two or three days. Uh, and after one courtship, they might need courtship activity. They might need to rehydrate for the next day, which would probably be the last day of their life. But um, they, they can get a little bit of water to help them through that. Um, courtship involves a massive gathering of, of males over water, especially rivers, again, at dusk or dawn. Uh, males kind of fly up in an up and down motion in a swarm together. And then the females enter the swarm. Uh, and then that's when the, the she's pursued by males. Um, the males will grasp the females by those stronger front legs, and then mate, and then and then release her. Um, the the mayflies are unique in the insect world in their ancient form in that they have paired genitalia. So males have two penis-like organisms for transferring sperm called a deji, and females have two openings. Uh, sexual openings called gonopores. And so this might seem strange to us, but when you consider that the ancestral insect body, that ancestral insect form involves segments, body segments, bilaterally symmetrical, each segment has a pair of appendages. So they have paired antennae, paired mouth parts, paired wings, paired legs. And so it, it actually makes sense in the original insects that they also had paired genitalia. Um, and that was retained in the mayflies. The females then go off to lay eggs. Um, depending on the species, she'll do this in several ways. Uh, the simplest is that she just kind of flies low over the water, drops them like a, a bomber and, and flies away. They plop into the water. Um, another strategy, a little more gentle, is she'll alight on the water and dip her abdomen just under the water to deposit the eggs. And then a third less common strategy is that she will actually swim down in the water, completely submerge herself, swim down and find a nice little sheltered crevice or, or a clump of vegetation to shelter her eggs. Um, in the few minutes, hours or days of her lifespan though, she can, she can lay hundreds or even thousands of eggs. Um, and some species can also lay unfertilized eggs, which are genetic clones of mom through parthenogenesis. And one species of mayfly even gives birth to live young. So the eggs hatch inside mom, uh, just like garter snakes, and then she gives birth directly to squiggling little nymphs. Um, sometimes what I call my kids too. There is a dark side to egg laying though, literally and figuratively. Uh, when it comes to human development in mayflies, a dark asphalt road, especially when it's wet, can easily resemble a river. And a lot of these roads will follow a river and be open and on top. And so, um, especially in the UV range in, in which mayflies see. So you will find mayflies that will lay eggs on roads, which is uh, an, an evolutionary dead end. They think the roads are rivers. Um, and sometimes the males will swarm over roads, a um, little less harmful, uh, you know, evolutionarily. But, uh, but the mayflies can't, you know, always tell the differences. Like birds can't see windows. Um, they're programmed to look for these dark, flat surfaces in the UV. And it just happens to be that flat roads, sometimes, you know, other materials will look just like water. Um, and, you know, even we humans can be fooled by the reflection of light off road uh, when you see the, the mirage of water on the highway. Um, and sadly, birds can also be fooled by this. Um, you know, particularly like megansers or loons will try to land on a, a parking lot in the rain, um, which leads to a lot of deaths and injuries. So again, like rocketry, something we can hopefully engineer to be better in the future. Uh, the egg stage can be very short or 
quite long. Uh, so we're actually going to see later how short it can be. Um, but it also, in the egg stage, development can be paused for a long time, for, for years. Um, but then, like many insects from the eggs, the nymphs are hatched. Uh, nymphs are aquatic, also like many other insects. Um, may, but mayfly nymphs are born without gills, but they can still exchange oxygen through their skin, their exoskeleton. Uh, and then nymphs grow in stages, or instars, where they molt into slightly bigger nymphs each time. Each time they molt, not only do they get bigger, they, they grow an, a, an, an ex, they grow a set of gills. So the, the first molt, they're going to grow their first pair of gills. Then with each successive molt, they grow more gills. Um, and because their adult stage is, well, I don't know if it's because of, but the adult stage is so short, a lot of the adaptations happen in this nymph stage, and they tend to live much longer in this nymph stage. Um, and uh, so that's where you see uh, more of the kind of like survival type of, of adaptations. Um, and they tend to have more nymph stages than a lot of other insects. Uh, you know, 10 is pretty common, even up to 50, which is very uncommon in insects to have so many uh, instars before they turn into adults. Um, they also contribute to a healthy ecosystem, so it's good to have them around. Um, and then on the flip side, well, if they cannot tolerate pollution. So if, so they're, they're what's called a bioindicator. If you have a high concentration of mayfly nymphs in a stream, that's a bioindicator that you have a healthy, clean, highly oxygenated aquatic system. And our fly fishing friends will create lures for sometimes for each nymphal stage for each species. Um, you know, so this is one on the lower right uh, that resembles a, a nymph. And then, of course, when they're fishing, they also want to imitate the behavior of that, you know, particular stage. So if it's an adult insect, they're going to be, you know, doing other things. If it's nymphs, they're going to, you know, go to the bottom. And, 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 and what they put on those, they want to behave like what you see in the water. It's really amazing the amount of detail that goes into uh, into the fly fishing and the amount of detail that goes into uh, mayfly nymphs. But at some point, the relatively long life of the mayfly nymph comes to an end and they emerge from the water and become an adult. Um, but before this mayfly becomes an adult, they do what no other group of insects in the world do. They molt into first a winged subadult stage and that's called the subimago stage. Or if you're a fly fisher person, this is called the dun stage, um, an appropriate title because the duns tend to be duller than adults. Um, with one exception, duns are not sexually mature. They cannot mate. Their wings have tiny hairs attached, likely to help water drain off of them if they get wet. Um, this is the stage that they are most susceptible to predation. They're vulnerable on the surface of the water, so fish just go nuts, uh, have a feeding frenzy. Many duns are able to fly right away, so then the birds and bats and other dragonflies and things notice them, and they start flying in. It's like a bait ball that you see in in uh, in ocean videos, but this in this case, it's uh, it's uh, insects. They're getting hit from below, getting hit from above, getting hit from every which way. And um, there's so many predators that like to eat them, and so this is where the mayfly developed its other very well known unique strategy in that they synchronize their emergence um, within a day or two or even with hours of each other. So they evolved the strategy that says, okay, I know I'm super vulnerable. I know there's a lot of things that want to eat me. Uh, so we're going to emerge. We're going to go hell or high water and come out at the exact same time. And we know that you predator will eat a lot of us, but you can eat all of us. There's just going to be too many of us. And then, so a lot of us will survive. Um, and this this is probably what selects for such a short adult lifespan because they're just so vulnerable during the courtship. They're vulnerable during emerging, they're vulnerable during the courtship. So they just kind of do it all at once very quickly. Um, and they are called mayflies simply because most of these swarms happen in May. Um, but there are mayflies that emerge in April and there are mayflies that emerge into September. So, uh, but mayflies is, is when we've noticed them in history, and that's why they're called the mayflies. 
And now that they have emerged, they're again, so they've emerged, they're not adults yet. They're these, they're, they're the duns, they're the, the sub imagos. Um, they look like adults, but they still have to undergo one more molt to become adults. And then the adults, they're called imagos, or if you're a fly fisher, they're called spinners at this point. And these are the only insects in the world that molt from an already winged stage into, into another winged stage or in, in, into an adult. And then once they're adults, they're all re ready for those huge mating swarms that we talked about. And these swarms will attract tourists, just like the, the fireflies uh, in the Appalachians. People will come from, you know, all parts of the world to places like, like Hungary is, is really known for for uh, mayfly swarms and other places around the world. So the tourists will come, then they pester the heck out of the locals because it's this, you know, live fast, die young lifestyle. There's there's accounts of municipalities needing snow plows and shovels to clear the roads, parking lots. In the, in the old days, there'd be wheelbarrows. Um, some swarms are big enough that they show up on weather radar. Uh, and so this is this is what's been noticed now and throughout history. Um, you know, and, and if you live in a, in a region where you have healthy water and, um, and mayflies, then it becomes a thing. And, you know, growing up in Milwaukee, it really hasn't been a thing for me. Um, but it is super interesting to see how often mayflies show up in, in the historical records that we know of, that we have. Um, in fact, one of the oldest surviving works of, of literature that we know of is the Epic of Gilgamesh, and you know, talk something a story from four thousand years ago, which which pales in comparison to many of the other stories that are you know tens of thousands of years old. Um, but in in the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, they reference mayflies in the comparison of the brief briefness of Gilgamesh's life compared to the adult mayflies. So. Gilgamesh is a short life, but the culture, the, the towns, the cities that he's part of have a long life. And the adult mayfly is but a tiny uh, speck of time, but the river is, is forever. So um, then 2,300 years ago, Aristotle wrote in the history of animals, uh, this quote, bloodless and many footed animals, whether furnished with wings or feet, move with more than four points of motion, as for instance, the day fly, which is the mayfly, ephemeron, moves with four feet and four wings. And I may observe in passing this creature is exceptional, not only in regard to the duration of its existence, whence it receives its name, but also because though a quadruped, it has wings also. So here Aristotle notices that the mayfly is unique and that it often only has two or four legs. In modern times, uh, mayflies continue to make their way into literature in an episode of Sherlock Holmes and BBC. The perpetrator was called the Mayfly because he wore his disguise for exactly one day. And then my favorite is probably a 2001 play by David Ives. It's a short comedy where he imagines what two mayflies might discuss during their one day of existence with each other. So that is the mayfly. Uh, again, so much more out there. Um, but I am going to end in a moment of Zen that shows just how awesomely quick mayfly development is. So if you're watching this uh, recorded and you want a link, you can you can email me, um, but we can't show it here due to copyright law. So thank you for joining me. We'll see you next time. I will stop sharing.